Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so yesterday we, we had an interesting conversation about where GSNs come from, how they originate, how they form and evolve over time. I, I think we kind of we scratched the surface on that conversation. We'll get a bit more deeply into that this morning. Um, you know, there, there's probably many different ways this happens, and, and Tom has done us a great service in helping to illustrate one of the ways in which GSNs evolve and, and take shape to solve global problems. I was thinking about it, you know, in some cases we have this kind of spontaneous combustion, right? There's an event, there's a new piece of legislation that comes out, you know, an event could be like a, a crisis situation, a, a network comes together to try and solve the problem. Uh, there's a new revelation, there's sweatshops and Nike supply chain, a you know, network comes together around that kind of event. Um, in other cases, and we talked about this yesterday, there's a kind of long evolutionary process of dialogue and engagement between multiple, multiple parties and the GSN forms organically over time. The kind of situation that Tom is describing in network orchestration is a little bit different. This is when a third party deliberately, carefully orchestrates a network to achieve an objective. And Tom will talk, you know, he'll, he'll give us the, the full view and, and, and overview of what orchestration means. Uh, we'll talk about the specific characteristics that are important for orchestrators. As an organization, if you want to build and, and curate a network, what kind of characteristics do you have to have as an organization? And then we have Tim from Purpose, Tim Dixon, uh, he'll be talking about the role that Purpose has played in actually building networks as a bit of an orchestrator, I think you could say, of sorts, right? Really? And um, so they've had some, some really fascinating examples. They've worked on climate change. They've worked on human trafficking. So we'll talk about some of those examples. And Don did a very nice job introducing Bruce. Um, as it turns out, and Tom will verify this, some UN agencies have actually been amongst the leading orchestrators, right? We identified five or six what we called super orchestrators that were responsible for many of the GSNs that we've identified. And several UN agencies are among those categories. So Bruce will share some insights about what's been happening inside the United Nations in terms of their thinking about how do they participate more robustly and deeply in building networks. So I'm going to start off with Tom. Tom will take us through about a seven or eight minute presentation, just giving us the highlights from the research, and then we'll get into the conversation. So Tom, take it away. Great. Do you want to go up there? Or? Yeah, by all means. Well, it's great to have um, the GSN team and all of you here today. We at the Blavatnik School think of ourselves as kind of a mini GSN. We have about 40, or sorry, it's about 60 students from about 40 countries, so it's a very international place and we're dedicated to making the world a better place. So we're trying to do our part here, and it's great to be able to share this space and this experience with all of you who are working on similar problems in other places. I want to start today by talking about the big problem that Don identified at the beginning, how we solve big global problems like climate change, like financial regulation, like swine flu, and other kinds of problems that cross national boundaries. Now, the traditional way we've done this has been organizations like the United Nations, intergovernmental bodies that bring countries together to dev devise common solutions, create different mechanisms for rules and enforcement of rules, um, service delivery, other ways of handling those problems. What I'm showing you with this graph is this account of the number of such organizations in the world from the end of World War II until today. Now, as you see, it's gone up quite a lot. This makes perfect sense. We have a lot more interdependence these days. We have a globalized economy. We have lots of reasons to need to manage interdependence. But if you, look at the, if you look at the rate of growth on a year by year basis of these organizations, you find a pretty steady deterioration. So the red line is showing you how many, what percentage of the base increased or decreased on a year on year basis. And you see that today it's gone almost to zero. We're basically not growing our international governance capacity, interstate governance capacity anymore. Now, does that mean that we have We've reached a saturation point that we don't need any more management of transnational boundary problems or interdependence. I think the answer is pretty clearly no. The world is getting more integrated, not less. It's not staying the same. And so we have this real governance gap opening up. Now, as Don said, we also live in a period of tremendous innovation in global governance with things like GSNs coming onto the scene, trying to pick up some of this gap. Now, there, it's a relatively new phenomenon. There are some that are ancient, that predate the nation state itself, but a lot of these things have come up, I would argue, in response to the growing gap we see here. 
Um, and the question is really how much do they add up to? Are these going to fill a big chunk of what we need? And two, if not, how can we bring them to a higher level of scale and ambition? How can we get more started? How can we make them work? And those two questions were really what motivated the paper that um, I want to talk about very briefly today, which uh, has been published by the GSN team. Uh, before I do, I just want to note this paper is co-authored with my colleague Ken Abbott at Arizona State University and is mostly the work of a few Blavatnik School students who have gone around and poked and soaked and found all these different GSNs around the world. I just wanted to recognize them. So Leo and Aaron, can you just wave your hands? Thank you for your great work. Also Tatiana and Luisa, who aren't here, were instrumental as well. They were here yesterday. They were here yesterday. Yeah. So um, this is really the power of teamwork, what you're about to see. So we went around and we tried to find um, as many GSNs, sorry, this as many as possible. Um, and uh, we, we managed to identify about 297. Now, what were our criteria for including these things? We're looking for um, innovative kinds of, of governance solutions that brought together sub or non-state actors, cities, companies, uh, civil society groups, parts of existing governments, um, and also intergovernmental organizations. We wanted to see if they had a certain structure, whether they followed what we call the orchestration model. Now, orchestration is a strategy where a would-be governor would like to control some problem, would like to get companies to reduce their carbon emissions, say, or would like to get um, cities to do more on sustainable transportation, but doesn't have the actual authority to order them to do so because it's, it's not that kind of organization. We're not living in a hierarchical structure here but it nonetheless has some kind of resources to get them together and to begin shaping and moving them toward these kinds of governance solutions. Um, there are different ways it can do that, through initiating, supporting, or shaping, or steering. Um, brings these people together into a global solution network or some other kind of governance arrangement um, and gets them to begin solving the problem that it can't regulate itself. It uses its convening power to get results it couldn't actually achieve through hierarchical forms. So we found a bunch of these around the world. Um, we don't have what I can um, oh. seem to have a few. So we can solve global solution problems, but it's not harder to solve technological problems. Oh, um, there here we, we go. go. We actually went around and found um, a good list. Now, we can't say this is a comprehensive list of all the global solution networks or other similar initiatives around the world. We managed to find 297, which is a pretty good start. It's currently pretty comprehensive. We think we're reflecting the sort of main ones here. And we're able to get information about um, 223 of them. And we found that about 53 of those, or about a quarter, exhibited this orchestration characteristic. So orchestration is a big part of what's going on here. It's not the majority. It's not everything. But it's a big chunk of what we see happening. Um, we tried to look at who actually is doing the orchestrating. So what we found is that actually the traditional actors in global governance, the intergovernmental organizations, are the biggest actor. About half of all orchestrated GSNs come from um, intergovernmental organizations. National governments make up the second biggest chunk, about a third, with NGOs coming in the bottom. And if we look at who's actually, who they're orchestrating, so here we're calling them intermediaries, um, we see that actually the mo most of them are in the private sector. Firms and NGOs make up a big chunk National governments are, are being shaped as well, and local governments coming up behind. So there's definitely a clear direction between the kind of traditional actors in global governance and the sort of new ones um, in these orchestrated forms of interaction. Um, we also wanted to look a bit at where orchestration is happening, what issue areas this is happening in. So on the left, you see a pie chart showing you which all the GSNs that we looked at, the 297, what issue areas they um, appear in. And on the right, you see just the orchestrated ones. As you see, a lot of this is happening in the environmental world. The environment has been an issue area that's really generated new forms of organizational uh, structures, in part because the problems are quite hard. Traditional governance institutions at the global level, they are weak and fragmented. So it's really become a fertile laboratory um, for innovation. More traditional areas of international politics, like security, you see less happening. Um, so our conclusion here was that orchestration is a big phenomenon, but not as big as it might be. And if you actually look at who's doing the orchestrating, as Anthony said, we found just basically six super orchestrators, a few UN entities, 
the United Nations Environment Program, the World Health Organization, which is an affiliated agency, the World Bank, um, and these are government level. Just two national governments playing a big role here, the United States government and the UK government. No others playing a massive role. And just one NGO, the World Wildlife Fund. So those six entities between them account for, I think they're involved in about 60% of the initiatives I'm showing you here. So where is the EU? Where are the big corporations? Where are the other big national governments? There's a lot more people who could be doing this who aren't. And we think that's a bit of a shame, but also an opportunity, because it means that this strategy, properly developed and employed, could actually be generating a lot more solutions than it is right now. Um, let me just close by showing you a little bit of the answer to the second question, which is what characteristics of these orchestrators make them effective or not? And we came up with four sort of general principles. Remember, orchestrators have to govern by convincing others of the rightness of the cause and giving them the kind of information and resources they need to, get a, to come together and to develop a GSN. So it's a different kind of uh, tools for success than a lot of traditional hierarchical forms of governance. The first one is obviously legitimacy. If you don't, aren't seen as someone who can solve the problem, you're not going to be effective at bringing people together. Focality is the second one. You have to be able to pick up the phone and get someone to call you back if you want to be a convener. This is your ability to make, get the right people in the room. Um, resources can be informational. So you have to be able to tell people what the problem is, give them a sense of what the solutions could be to show how their interests align with your interests to solve this problem. It could also be material in nature. Obviously, some entities um, that we mentioned in this list are the governments and international organizations that have some resources to actually um, help bring people along. And finally, you have to be willing to do it. An organizational culture that, that uh, rewards reaching out beyond your bureaucracy, your own networks, having that openness that we talked about before. So I'm happy to talk about this in more detail, but I wanted to just give you this brief overview. The big conclusion here, like I said, is that we're not doing as much as we can to orchestrate, but, but this is a tool that's waiting to be, to be utilized. And so it'd be fascinating to hear people's thoughts on where this, we, we, see this, we might see this develop uh, going forward. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tom. Um, what a nice empirical overview. It's, it's, it's nice to see the, the charts and the distribution of orchestrators and who's involved and who's not involved. Importantly, Tom, I was wondering, as a follow-up, and then we'll, we'll get to the other panelists, and, and if you have questions, please just raise your hands and feel free to jump in. What's the difference? Because it, it could be, a, you know, possibly you could conflate two concepts here, which is one is that these networks are being controlled by external entities versus orchestrated, and I think it's a subtle difference. And you alluded to three strategies in terms of initiating, shaping, and steering. Could you... Give us a little more color in, in terms of defining what those strategies mm. look like and what the difference is between, say, a sort of top-down approach to orchestrating and a bottom-up approach. Sure. Let me give you an example um, from, uh, from this country. The exact Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is a, is a program, and today a multi-stakeholder organization that tries to get uh, extractive industry companies, oil companies, mining companies, to be more transparent in what they pay national governments and how they, um, they work with the places where they extract resources in order to prevent corruption there. This is a curse on many countries where it should be a blessing. And the idea here is that companies have an important role and a responsibility to make sure that the money they're paying to national governments goes to the welfare of the people there and not to mine the pockets of um, <coughs> people who send it to Swiss bank accounts. So the British Department for International Development, DFID, decided this was a big problem. It was blocking their ability to achieve development goals in the countries they were working. That's this huge problem. But they had no authority as a development agency to regulate the companies and force them to publish what they pay. Um, so they decided to create this initiative that would bring companies, NGOs, national governments together into a multi-stakeholder forum, agree mutually on a set of rules, and have some sort of accounting system. Now, it hasn't been an enormous success. There's been um, lots of difficulties in getting countries, this is you know, a deep problem, but it shows a strategy that you know, there's a lot more than um, could have been done. And it uses this tool of convening and sort of legitimacy power as opposed to command and control, which wouldn't have been an option. Interesting. Now, I want to call it one other subtlety in your analysis, which is the role of the intermediary. It's, it's not obvious initially why the orchestrator needs an intermediary or why they often choose to work through a third party rather than orchestrate directly. Mm. And Could you shed some light on that? Mm. 
So let me give you another example, um, which is the uh, C40 network of mega cities working on climate change. We're going to have someone, I think, this afternoon talking yep. about that in more depth. But um, this is an example not of a traditional actor orchestrating a network, but of a, a new kind of actor in world politics, the City of London Act, which, as the City of London, wanted to do something about climate change. London has a lot of emissions, but not much on a global scale. So the mayor knew he needed to bring together a bunch of other mayors to get this done. And they started meeting together as mayors. Um, and now those cities, I think there's about 12% of the world population are part of the C40 network, uh, about 60 or so cities. So that's a huge chunk of emissions. That's not something London could have done by itself. It needed to reach out to these other cities as intermediaries to achieve that goal. It found they had as a common agenda. They wanted to work together. And it's probably one of the more exciting things happening in the climate change realm today. So I think the intermediaries come in because they have the actual ability to govern something, even if they can't do it on their own, they need to be brought together to take advantage. Right. So one other question that I want to turn to Tim and to Bruce, and I was curious, I mean, your data clearly shows that IGOs are by far and away the, the, the most active orchestrators. And you can maybe speculate as to why, I mean, and you pointed to the four characteristics, legitimacy, resources, focality, and the organizational culture. What do you think is lacking in some of the institutions that don't engage actively in orchestration, particularly the companies and, and NGOs? Are they lacking legitimacy to lead? Um, is it the focality? Is it they don't have sufficient? Companies clearly have lots of resources. So where, where are they potentially falling short, or are they just not seizing the opportunities? I think there's a lot of cognitive inertia in a lot of places. Um, the um, people don't necessarily, if you're a, a bureaucrat working in an organization, you may not be rewarded by your organization for thinking about this kind of activity. Um, maybe some are more conducive in that way, and those that we see, I don't think it's a surprise, we see the same organizations trying this out, experimenting with it, finding it works, coming back to it again and again. That organization has developed a way of doing it, has learned how to do it, um, and other organizations are coming to it for the first time. Um, the Indian government is uh, quite um, a good example. They've been, the Indian diplomats are quite conservative in the international climate change negotiations. They only want to talk about national commitments by developed countries. Um, India is leading the world. Its cities and companies are doing more in these transnational climate change world space than any other developing country. So India shines in this way. But that, has, that message hasn't filtered up to the diplomatic level. Um, so there is a real disconnect between these different things. Interesting. Tim, let's, oh, yeah, Simon, go ahead. Can I just ask a question for you? Yeah, please, yeah. Um, sorry, for those who don't, I'm Simon Giles from Accenture, I run our city practice. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be a big focus on volume, and there's almost kind of an underlying assumption that the proliferation is a good thing. You know, the more of these things that we have, the better. And I wonder whether that's part of the problem, actually, mm -hmm. that, you know, the reason why the private sector isn't engaging is that they're worried about proliferation and the fact that, proliferation will mean dilution. And until these GSNs gather a certain amount of critical mass, they lack effectiveness and efficacy. And maybe focus and consolidation and a drive towards effectiveness and measurement of outcomes and actually assessing, picking the winners effectively and saying, you know what, we don't have resources to back every single horse here. We're going to wait until we see some winners emerge and then we'll back them. And you know, I wonder whether that is something that's happening and actually mm -hmm. the, the idea of proliferation is going to be counterproductive in terms of engaging with some of the more recent actors. Can I comment on that for a second and then I'll throw it back to Tom? That's an interesting sort of hypothesis about what might be going on, but I think what I've been observed in, in practice is that actually companies are quite happy to proliferate their own company-led initiatives in the sense that you know they, they like to have their their own CSR initiatives and so forth, and, and haven't, for the most part, um, taken the leadership to actually build the, the kind of broader, more um, meta networks that perhaps would be required in some of these areas. And, and maybe that is related to issues around perceived legitimacy to be leaders in this space. Um, and, and I don't know, and I'd be curious to, to get your views too, Mary. Mary, do you want to start with the system? Um, what I'm wondering is if there's a hybrid model that we work with because there are clear initiatives that we are um, we are orchestrated by someone. 
those who live in very large. Um, but some of the major initiatives that we do, oftentimes in uh, like disaster relief, we will play an orchestrator, but in some of the relationships, there is a, um, a funder relationship. Right. Which to me then is not exactly an orchestrator. It has a bit of that command and control, but not everyone. So that's where I, I feel like in certain situations, it, it's we are playing the initiative sphere because that's our strategy. And in some situations, part of the ecosystem of providers, it will be funding, but not all. Mm. So that's where I, and I agree, um, we tend to do those as, the, as a, um, primary lead because it allows us to move fast and drive mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But it you know, you've got to have more of that orchestrated relationship with the community mm -hmm. because they're the ones actually doing the, the change. Mm -hmm. And we also tend to say they feel more effective than some of the larger orchestrated ones. Mm -hmm. Again, we've got shorter timelines. We need it done by a certain period of time. And so I think that, that that's where I feel like I'm driving orchestration strategies, but not exactly related to it. Mm. So, mm. Interesting. Um, did, Ellen. I have from the EU, a still very big common question. We live in a, a complex world without expectation. How could we or can we reconciliate self generation and orchestration? The second question regarding the skills uh, linked to orchestration. How can we improve the capacity of recognizing patterns in this way? And second, how can we develop uh, our capacity of sense making, making sense of what is unfolding? I think, for example, we don't internalize sufficiently the emerging collaborative paradigms. Not only setting up at individual level, but what about the global level? Mm -hmm. And third, how can we, based on the common intention, minimize the consensus, not maximize the consensus. If we minimize the consensus, we need space for improvisation and for accommodation, including among projects unlike the last month, which will be more faster and more efficient. I'll ask the panel to, to reflect on some of those issues. I, I want to get Tim involved and just to tell some of your stories. So Purpose is an organization that goes out and, and actually builds movements for progressive change as I mentioned, has worked on climate change, human trafficking, a number of other important issues. Tim, maybe you could just walk us through an example like human trafficking. You, you were asked to essentially build a network around this issue. Tell us what the intervention looked like and describe the process. And does it kind of map onto what uh, Tom has been describing in terms of the principles and strategies of orchestration in your experience? Sure. Um, thanks. Um, and thank you for the Invitation. It's sort of as you, our, our work is incubating lots of these different interventions in a lot of different subject areas. So it's nice to um, have the opportunity to sort of stand back and look at a taxonomy and think with a little bit of reflection. Although I do feel like I have arrived at the end of the world because here we are at this august centre of learning, the University of Oxford, with all of its great history, in a room full of bookshelves, and there isn't one book in the room. <laughs> so this is the end of the world. All we have is Wi-Fi, that's all we need. <laughs> um, a, a couple, just a, a background comment before jumping into the example of, yeah. of human trafficking. So one of the things that we've found useful in, I guess now what we've got about 45 million people have been involved as joined different initiatives, different movements that we've sort of started in lots of different areas. Some of them are multi-issue, some of them are quite specific. Um, we sort of think about the, the larger change of what's going on in a world where an Airbnb can become the biggest provider of rooms of accommodation in the world, bigger than every hotel chain. Um, in a world where a Beppe Grillo, a, an Italian comedian, can get a quarter of the country's votes coming from nowhere. Um, where you've got you know the Ubers and the Lyfts and so on taking on the conventional taxi industry. All of these changes going on in sort of private enterprise, in the way in which people come together. And, and there's something common to a lot of these examples that they're they're driven not by the the sort of the old currency of of power as something which is centralised and held in someone's hands and then kind of doled out um, and it's inaccessible and it's closed, but in a in a world where the power is a currency that's kind of shared and and created through mass participation and the, the, the involvement of the many and driven by peers rather than driven sort of top down. 
Um, and so, you know, this is the new world and a lot of business models are reflecting that, a lot of what's going on in politics, a lot of what's going on institutionally. And there are a set of actors who are struggling to, you know, deal with this, with this changing world. And so if you think of this as a kind of models of older, older forms of power and, and newer forms of power that are, you know, renegotiating that space. And I've spent part of my life working with the very conventional old power world of being at a political party, being, you know, winning election campaigns, being in government. I was the um, Prime Minister's speechwriter in Australia for a few years, economic advisor. And we, we took power just before, a few months before the financial crisis. So it was a really um, stark moment of looking at what can the old power institutions of government do in that moment of crisis and how can they kind of pick up these new currents of power that exist. Anyway, that's, that's all to sort of say background, but it's, it's the context of thinking about this change in the way that power works that, that we're in the midst of sort of renegotiating that space. So in that context, um, what the, the purpose work is to think about how you build the infrastructure of, um, of new social movements. We've got this capacity to bring huge numbers of people together um, very quickly um, across the world, breaking down all the sort of national boundaries, even language boundaries to some extent. Um, and they can, by, by taking action, by participating together, by funding things, um, they can achieve some kind of change in the world. And so what the thing that we've thought about is, because we've involved in building some of those things, we've thought about the role that a business, which is purposes of sort of social business, um, so we don't have to maximise profits, but we think the model to scale this stuff up quickly is, is the business model is the best model. Um, we think about how you build the um, sort of expertise, how you build, how you invest in people, how you develop more people with these sorts of skills to use these new digital platforms in smart ways um, and to incubate new social movement organisations, incubate new interventions that can bring people together and achieve some kind of change, can, can identify gaps and can fill those gaps. Um, and that's, the, that's our kind of thinking. So we've done you know, a bunch of different things. I mean, most recently, we'd been working with um, Michael Bloomberg's um, folks in New York on the gun control issues, where they were putting lots of money into the old style, drop you know, $10 million into TV ads in the middle of a congressional district race. And our argument for them, with them was like, you guys are spending a lot of money, and this is a very old way to do it. Your problem is you won't get change on gun control unless you face down the power of the NRA, which is a real grassroots organisation. It's powerful. It knows how to leverage its power in smart ways during, in the middle of congressional races and so on, not just TV ads. You need to build a movement. You need to actually have real people. Um, and so we architected a strategy, which is a movement called Every Town, which was launched a few weeks ago. And, and that's an example of an organisation. It's got assets, it's got money, but actually needs people if it wants to achieve change on a really difficult, intractable issue. On human trafficking, um, the Anthony's question. So we had a, a wealthy philanthropist come to us and say, um, he, he actually literally said to me, Tim, I want to end child sex trafficking on Facebook. And I was trying to work out whether there was some terrible thing that Facebook was involved in that we had to campaign <laughs> against. But actually what he was saying was, you know, social media is like this amazing new thing, can't we sort of press the buttons and we'll stop sex trafficking. And what we said to him was, um, people come to us because they see us building these big movements and lots of people, but our point was like, so what would be the reason why you get a million people? Sure, I can do a change.org petition and get a million people to sign it if I make it smart enough, but like what does clicking on something online actually achieve? And, and our sort of conclusion was, yeah, definitely there's a power in mobilising lots of people, but you've got to have a larger sort of strategic analysis of why human trafficking or modern day slavery exists, what are the factors behind it and what, can, what interventions, most importantly, can solve it. So we looked at this, spent a few months really, and this is a kind of um, like a McKinsey sort of exercise, a McKinsey social sector exercise of trying to landscape that world and say who's doing what, concluded that there are hundreds and hundreds of organisations working on sex trafficking. Um, very few think of it in a systemic kind of structural way. So lots of people rescuing girls from brothels, but in some cases literally taking them out, taking them to orphanages that will recycle them 
through the same system back into the brothels, um, you know, six months, 12 months later. Um, and who's looking at the structural intervention? So our conclusion was, there's not enough evidence of actually what works. Lots of people doing like individual initiatives, very few of these things are scaled up or work or are tested in a different context. We actually need something like what the, uh, the Global Fund did with HIV AIDS, um, malaria, TB back 10, 15 years ago, where large amounts of money were put in with lots of different interventions and people measured what actually worked. And if you can measure what works, show that it works, you can get more money for it and you can get more resources. And my point to um, Andrew Forrest, the, the funder of this, was nobody's actually done that with trafficking. There, there just aren't really at scale interventions. Actually, and literally my conversation was, you know, Andrew, you can make a big difference on this issue. You know, you want it to be a life work, but you know the biggest thing that you bring, and of course he's thinking like, it's my brains and my charisma. It's like, frankly, it's your money. You know, you've got a lot of money. So if you commit, and this is my recommendation, and the weird thing was, I said $250 million, and then he sort of went out a few weeks later and said, I'm giving $250 million. And I thought I should have said $500. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but he, I, I said, you need to do a global fund on, on this thing. You need to like, like actually intervene a bunch of different solutions um, and be smart about it. And the smart way is that there's governments like the DFIDs, for example, the, the state aid agencies, who have resources and actually are looking for ways to spend that in an effective manner. And if you as a private sector partner, because the sort of governments get a lot of public cover if the private sector's putting in money and they match money, right? Like they, they, the public perception is that the private sector is much smarter in how they allocate resources, sometimes true, sometimes not. But, but if you go and you say, I'll put 250 million on the table, if you differed, if the Norwegians, if whatever, um, put match that dollar for dollar, you can very quickly scale that up to you know, 500, 750 billion dollars. And let's actually do a bunch of interventions that test what works. Also, that's the, that's the sort of testing side of what works. Secondly, you've got to actually make this a thing. Right? You've got to get people talking about slavery. And I thought the best example was what Transparency International did with the Corruption Perception Index a few years ago that you know, has a league table and measures countries on how they perform and all these measures. And, and so as a result, you know, in the last 15 years, in the sort of public conversation, in the kind of you know, the learned public sort of space globally, people talk about Corruption as a thing, it's measured, it's like, it's a tangible thing. So you create a global slavery index. You've got to actually like make this a thing. You've got to communicate to countries where they can, who are actors on this stuff, that, that you're going to be measured, you're going to be held accountable. And the first time you do that, that's going to be scrappy, but it'll get better, but commit to doing it year by year. So they launched that in Chatham House, what, October last year, and it's scrappy, but it's a real thing. So slavery trafficking is becoming a thing. And I, we said language, Modern day slavery is more powerful than trafficking because if you say trafficking, is it drugs, is it whatever? So, you know, use consistent language. So that was the second thing. And then the third thing we said was, sure, look, we have the expertise in movement building and we see that if, you've, if you can work out what works, get resources into it, if you can use conventional media channels to talk about this thing and get people thinking about trafficking and slavery, then there's a role for a social movement which can bring pressure to bear at the moments when that matters, can bring pressure, bring pressure to bear to get the you know, Filipino government to sign the Convention on Domestic Slavery, for example, or to get Qatar to do something about the Bangladeshi workers who are held in slavery on construction sites, blah, blah, blah. Lots of different campaigns you can run, but work out what works. And so the, the point is for, you know, we, we do the social movement piece, but, but we try to do it in an intellectually thoughtful and critical manner that just because, you know, you got a hammer in your hand doesn't mean that everything's a nail. You know, doesn't you don't always need a million people, five million people. And Walk Free is now is the name of the organisation. Is Walk Free? It's six million people. It's a big. It's the biggest movement of its kind in in the in this area. Um, but it's effective only if it sort of fits into that larger picture. So I think that's the. I think the the thing to think about these networks is you know where they fit within the larger picture. If you're trying to achieve some kind of change. Are you making the strategically smart intervention that fills a gap that does something that others are not doing or that they're not doing successfully um, and make it work from there? So fascinating overview of, of that issue and, and how you tackled it. A couple of things I wanted to emphasize in, in what you said, and then I want to go to Bruce and get him engaged in the conversation here. One is that it seems that 
there must be some characteristics in terms of mobilizing large numbers of people that you've identified. I mean, what, what are some of the um, fundamental factors that are important to getting people's attention, getting them active, actually mobilizing them, having them to you know, think differently about an issue and take action? And then the flip side of that, or, or maybe the other side of the coin, is what you said to be systemic change. How do you actually translate from a fairly shallow form of engagement through a petition or, or a Facebook campaign into something deeper that actually results in the meaningful change that you're describing? So what, what are some of the ingredients in building them? I think that like in a really practical nuts and bolts sort of way, um, you know, a, a strategy is the first thing. Like it takes, before we jump in and start something, we, we do quite a lot of work on thinking about um, what, what's, the, what's the way in which you connect lots of people to this issue? How do they come to it at the moment? Uh, and so we think about, is there a fresh way of doing the storytelling? Is there a fresh way of creating an emotional connection point? Um, generally, we will create, so we understand the power of brands, which the private sector does, the government, you know, public sector doesn't. So we think about, you know, when we, to take Walk Free, all these organisations with names like Free the Slaves, End Slavery Now, um, Ban Slavery, whatever, they're all placed in the problem. Our sense was the emotional connection point here is the dignity of human freedom. So we call the organisation Walk Free. So we try and develop brands that have a power, a sense of agency to them. Because the thing that you're always trying to tap into is how do you develop people's sense of agency, their sense of participation. So, so India, we've just been in India and Brazil doing some work in the last few weeks. India and Brazil, you know, and emerging countries, Africa, it's so true as well, are super interesting because people are waking, are waking up to a sense of agency that they didn't have in the past. And that's not a smooth ride. Like, look at Egypt, which has ended up with a military dictatorship that's probably going to be more brutal and effective than Mubarak's was. Um, but there, there's a journey of, like, participation, engagement, agency, impact uh, is not smooth, but there is big part of the world where people, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs are sort of getting to that point where they're surviving. Um, the middle classes, they're sort of getting more aware, more educated, and they want their voice heard. And so you're tapping into that, but not in an exploitative fashion. So you don't say, and we're doing some work on Syria right now, for example, we don't say like, you know, click on this petition and end the war in Syria. Um, you actually have to give people an honest sense of, here's, here's our big picture of this problem, we believe your participation can make a difference and give them real stuff to do that can have real impact. So right now on Syria, for example, that might be helping a six-year-old boy um, get across the border in Jordan a couple of weeks ago, um, a Syrian, British Syrian boy um, where the foreign office was just like not working hard enough to get it to make it happen, put it into the media and, and that happened. Uh, you can't solve the big problem, but you can do the, the smaller pieces. So I think it's that, that thing of agency, understanding brand, understanding participation and how important it is for people to, to feel involved in that they have um, impact. In terms of the, um, the piece on how do you get beyond the shallowness and make it deep. So, so we think about some of the, the there's a journey of of sort of, if you think of the sort of supporter journey that an NGO will talk about or sort of customer experience that businesses will talk about, um, people start in the modern age, they generally will interact digitally first with something. They will consume content. Um, they, the next thing they'll do if they like that content is that they'll share it with their friends in some context, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is. Um, and it's moving people through that sort of consumption, sharing, the sort of shaping, so when they start making something, they take the selfie with the sign saying, you know, the Al Jazeera stuff right now about the reporters in, in, in jail in Egypt, so they take the selfie saying, you know, free the journalists, whatever. Um, so shaping funding, so, you know, Kickstarter, now the biggest funder of culture in, in America ahead of the National Endowment for the Arts, you know, super interesting how a model like that can go from nowhere. Um, so breaking down the power of financial institutions and spreading that to, to crowd. So, so funding is a, is a big issue. You know, the Obama campaign, um, which feels like an old example now, but you know, it's all driven by that sort of micro-funding piece. Um, getting people to produce. So think of Etsy, for example, that massive online marketplace where people create stuff, produce stuff and sell it. 
Um, no, you then, have 3D printing to go along 3D, with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, so, and, and that takes you into the, the economic models are changing as well. So the stuff that you can do that, you know, you can produce, you can, and, and, and the end point is sort of like, it's, it's co-owning. Um, so if you think of something like a Wikipedia, for example, where, you know, there's, the, the world owns it, in, really, like the, the world participates, shapes it and owns it. So it's thinking through, it's giving people a diversity of different ways to participate, giving them a sense of a journey where they can do more and be more impactful. Um, making people as much part of the community if they're just sort of, you know, doing the share thing. That's how the people start. But that the argument, you know, people, there's some, sometimes an argument about digital activism, is it just clicktivism? It's like, well, if, if you only ever sign a change.org petition, sure. But, you know, that is just, it's how people now participate. Well, the first thing I did as a, to participate politically was attend a political meeting of Oliver Tambo from the ANC speaking in Sydney Town Hall in Australia. That was my kind of political awakening moment. Um, but like very few kids are going to have that as their awakening moment going to a town hall meeting. Now, that would be several steps down the track, but it's, it's the online engagement. But the trick is to sort of how do you take people through a journey? So you're telling them a real story of like by doing more, you can have more, more impact and not just sort of stopping <laughs> at that, that kind of one moment of engagement. Let's go to Bruce. Bruce, so thanks for joining us. I know you're feeling under the weather, but... It's a pleasure to have you here, and as Don mentioned, Bruce is doing a tremendously important piece of work on defining the future of the United Nations and the role that the United Nations plays, not just in you know orchestrating networks, but the way it thinks differently about how it engages in the world and solving problems. And Bruce, I want to give you an opportunity to describe maybe briefly some of the research you're doing with us, but I wanted you to reflect in particular on the work that you had done, because Bruce spent 30 years with the UN development program, you led the partnership initiative. So you've, you're steeped in this, essentially. You have a lot of experience. Um, and, and clearly, Tom's research indicates that organizations like the UNEP and UNDP have been really leading the charge in terms of orchestrating multi-stakeholder multi networks. So what's, um, what's happening in, in those particular agencies that has differentiated them from other players in the international system or even within the UN system in particular? Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. We can, yeah. Oh, actually, your mic is off. Is the mic off? You want to check? I'm incompetent. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's why it's off. Apologies. Yeah, I got one of these, I guess, plane viruses or something. So I lost my voice. Generally speaking, that would be a very good thing. But uh, I guess for today, it was unfortunate. Um, and that's about... That's about the best I can do with, with my voice. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. It so happens I, I did a PhD here about 35 years ago uh, with, a, with a, a guy named Headley Bull that I'm sure some of you probably know of. I fear he may be turning in his grave if he knew that I was now dealing with things like GSNs and multi-stakeholder partnerships. <laughs> but he was, a, he was a great guy, so I'm sure he has a smile on his face anyway. Um, let me let me just go back to um, a little bit to the to the really broad story because I think that um, it's very important to uh, base in a way the discussion, which has been great, um, on things that change in the real world that therefore require people to do things differently. Otherwise, it becomes a bit I don't know what the word is ideological or abstract or something. And, um, and to me, a lot of this story, you know, evolves during the 90s. We all know the story, but whether it's the, the acceleration of globalization, whether it's what's happened on the communication side, whether it's the incredible shifts in the relationship between the private and the public, um, <coughs> <coughs> actually, it'd be wonderful to get another glass of, uh, if you, thank you very much. Um, I should have predicted that. Um, so what I try to do in this piece of work that I'll be doing with, uh, with Don is, um, is to try and take a bunch of case studies actually across the system, not focusing in any particular area. Um, thank you so much. And, um, to, oh, that's a sympathy cough I see. Um, yeah, just go out there and play. <laughs> 
So, um, and I think it's a fascinating story because the common thread is that really in many respects, whatever issue you're in or whatever agency you're dealing with, the need to adjust to a different kind of reality is there and gets expressed in different ways. I'm not saying by that that everybody performs equally competently or <laughs> far from it. But the, the nature of the problem, I think, is a very deep-seated one and, and kind of gives one one's, uh, one's base. So to give you some examples of the cases that I, that I chose to look at, and some of them, I'm sure some of you will think, how on earth can you think of that as related to GSNs or whatever? <coughs> But, um, you know, I would start with um, in the health sector. I think you mentioned environment. I mean, I think health is an area which is absolutely rife with, with experimentation, certainly in the, in the broadly defined development, development, corporation business. I think health has been the leader of new ways of doing things. And I just chose to take um, the, um, the alert, the alert system. A, uh, GORAN, G-O-A-R-N, that most of you are probably familiar with, or some of you are. Um, which is, after all, <laughs> an extraordinary um, concept if, you're, you know, if you stop and think about it, because you're establishing a watchdog to um, get people, practitioners, world round, to do stuff, because you don't trust that governments can, will actually do it. And if we look at what happened in the SARS case, the case indeed was that the Chinese government was very slow in that particular case to pick it up, and it was the network that then put the pressure and led to, to rail change. <clears throat> this takes me to a bit of a quibble with, with some of the use of the term UN, because the UN is actually, what is the UN? I don't mean to sound silly about it, but having worked there for 30 years, don't ask me what the UN is. Um, because it's, there's a lot of individuality in it. Um, Richard Jolly, Tom Weiss, Louis Emery, some of you are probably familiar with the Intellectual History series of the UN, and they talk about the three UNs. The Intergovernmental UN, the UN of, of, of leaders, civil servants, or whatever, and the UN of forces, NGOs, conferences, whatever it might be. Most of the stuff that's happening that's interesting around here uh, that would also come probably under your, um, uh, help me, remind me. Orchestration. Thank you, orchestration. Um, uh, it relates to individuals that create space within what we know as the UN. I mean, <clears throat> Brundtland broke through all of the existing regulations to get what she had to get done in the case of responding to SARS. <clears throat> Take a case, another case that I look at, uh, a wonderful case that some of you are probably familiar with, which is John Ruggie's work on the stuff on human rights and, and uh, business principles. You know, what, what is that? What is that animal? It's a special representative of the Secretary General. He worked in the UN, he then goes back to Harvard. He's trusted as an individual, he's appointed as a special representative. And he then convenes all sorts of multi-stakeholder fora um, to create um, outcomes that the intergovernmental process was completely unable to negotiate. But it's, it is a UN thing in a way, but it's definitely not intergovernmental. Um, and to me, a lot of the interest of the UN, I mean, my God, if, if the UN was really just the intergovernmental machinery, I can assure you I would not have survived 30 years. Um, there's a lot more, and it's very, it's very ambiguous and a lot of the stuff that relates to this is super ambiguous because it's, it's kind of crafted along um, deliberate ambiguities uh, which need to be managed. If you take the major <coughs> initiatives that the SG has launched over the last five years, sustainable energy for all, every woman, every child, et cetera, et cetera, everybody will have their own views as to how developed these are. <coughs> successful they are. But the interesting thing is back in New York, the eggshells that are being walked on to preserve the space to be able to do this kind of stuff uh, in the, uh, is, is quite remarkable. On the one hand, you want to try 
and have a license to operate, which, which requires you to relate somehow to the intergovernmental process. But on the other hand, you have to make sure that that need for a license to operate does not you know, dump you into a hole which is not being able to act without formal approval of the intergovernmental machinery, in which case nothing at all would happen or very little would happen. Um, there are um, some other interesting examples. I mean, there was a, another, another case that I took is the business call to action, which is something that I happen to be myself involved in. Um, but um, it was launched here by Gordon Brown. Um, and it was all about um, developing inclusive business models, not CSR type of stuff, but inclusive business based on core business principles and cases. Um, and again, it's interesting because basically um, you have a multi-stakeholder uh, advisory group. You have stuff which is clearly being steered out from one particular secretariat. Um, <coughs> but actually, if, if the issue is, is, is somebody controlling this, the answer is no, not at all. Governments barely know that this thing even exists. When I say governments, I mean the, the board of the United Nations Development Programme. Barely knows. I, I was just struck by your comment on entrepreneurial individuals, in particular Brundtland, Ruggie, and so right. forth. That strikes me as important. And Tom, I, I wonder if we need to add that to your framework in terms of defining principles. Whether you need real leaders in some cases to drive this kind of change forward. But I'm wondering, in terms of, I mean, is the culture of multi-stakeholder cooperation? participation, is it, is it sufficiently kind of baked into the way the UN thinks about how it tackles problems, or does it really require those unique individuals who think differently about how to solve problems to make stuff happen? Um, I mean, just first on entrepreneurship, as, I'm, as you know, there's been a huge literature, for example, on the concept of norm entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and the way that different people have <laughs> <coughs> created space, responsibility to protect that whole story around that. Um, from a very, very, very low license to operate, and something much bigger was, I mean, when John Ruggie took that job, he, um, he said, I was asked to do nothing, but I decided to do something. Well, I mean, that's probably <laughs> why, but it's pretty accurate, both in terms of what he said and also what actually happened. I believe that one of the important things about the UN is that it, there's a lot of space in it for, for people to do things that want to do things. If people want to sit back and say it's hopeless, I can give you piles of stuff to show you that it's hopeless. Um, but people go in and do make a difference. And the question is, how do you create these mechanisms to allow that to, um, to flourish? Yeah. And one of the things is not to go, you know, not to go further than what the authorizing environment will allow you to do. Push it, keep pushing it. That's what the great leaders do, but don't make that mistake of thinking that you can go completely off um, on your own because then I think you're in trouble. I think that the UN absolutely to, um, requires leaders. I mean, I think leadership is fundamental to that model because it's a deeply um, you know, conservative model, if I can put it that way. Um, but you know, my, I joined uh, UNDP, I'm not going to talk about UNDP, but I joined UNDP and 1982, and my almost my first administrator was Bill Draper. Will you explain to me how a Bill Draper gets to a UNDP? He's a, a Republican venture capitalist from Silicon Valley, fantastic guy, had no understanding of anything about the way the UN worked, and we were much better for it. He broke every conceivable rule, um, but somehow survived, partly because he didn't need the organization. I mean, he'd already made hundreds of millions. Um, something like the Human Development Report. You know, when we talk about, about um, um, GSNs and space and creativity and entrepreneurship, <coughs> the Human Development Report, which has, you know, become over the years a, a pretty, you know, well-known document. Again, we can like it or not like it. Um, it was the creation of one guy talking to another guy saying, I'm going to do this. And they then created an office called the Human Development Report Office, uh, 
and uh, which and I was in the middle of this so I can talk to it. And uh, whenever governments complained about what was going on, we said, no, no, that's independent, it's independent. You know, we can't control that, that's an independent office. What does that mean? It means absolutely nothing. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a unit of a UN organization. How can you get away with saying it's independent? But we completely got away with it. The minute that we were, uh, the minute that something was really good, people loved the Human Development Report, look at our report. We're so proud of our report. It's such a wonderful report. That's a line which I think is, um, one has to kind of understand what you can do with that and also how you can abuse it. We've got about 20 minutes, and I, I know all of you are probably keen to jump in here. Don has his hand up, and, and think of your questions and comments about orchestration for the panel members. Don, go ahead. Uh, yeah, great discussion. Um, this one's for Bruce. So we've got big uh, ambitions for this project, <coughs> material, and actually changing the UN. And there, there are, at very senior levels in the UN, people who understand the whole multi-stakeholder uh, GSM thing. Some would say that this could be banking his legacy and under his watch and holding his paradigm and solving the problems of the world is uh, forged. So when Bruce and I first sat down and talked about this paper, Bruce said, what do, you, what do you want to do? And I said, well, lots of people say the UN is no longer fit to function, so we're going to go in there with a blister critique of what's wrong with the UN, and we're going to show how it could be much more effective on 10 big issues by using the whole GSN approach. And he said, that will fail miserably. The, the whole culture of the UN will be like a bunch of antibodies that will come and crush that, and no one will even read your report. He says, the, the better approach, and what Bruce is applying it, is to say they're already doing this. It's just not being institutionalized. It's, uh, uh, that there's no real uh, body of knowledge to, that, that's uh, coherent to advance a whole new modus operandi that, in fact, the UN is embracing. So the research has generated a ton of great examples, and Bruce is just sitting in with them, that actually we're able to categorize and categorize <laughs> different, uh, uh, into the, uh, different groups. And should Bruce live to complete? <laughs> oh, gosh. But the, the bigger issue I'm raising here is uh, it, this really changed my thinking about how you get these traditional international organizations uh, to, to change. It's, it's you try and show in a positive way that this is working, that they're all doing it, and you should do it much more deeply. Yeah, if I could just one yeah. little thing in there. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I do think that we're <coughs> actually in a very interesting moment because. Um, there are a lot of, of bits that are not coming together right now. And so, you know, the, the, it's got to be moved in a certain direction if this thing isn't going to begin to falter. What I'm talking about, I don't know, some of you are probably very aware, some of you aren't, but Bob Ball, the Assistant Secretary General, who's been pushing a lot of this stuff, was at the head of trying to establish an institutional home for this in the UN. And that has not fared well at all uh, through the intergovernmental bodies that have been going out of the way to block it. Um, and there are also some very difficult discussions about the future institutional um, home for the sustainable energy for all and for every woman, every child or whatever. We could have a model, I mean, there could be a scenario, I, I sincerely hope it's not the case, for the sake of the UN, but um, there could be a, a scenario where a year from now, a lot of the bigger initiatives migrate out of the UN because it just doesn't seem to, to work. Um, that, that's a very pessimistic model. The other model is um, is that things get worked through in a way that you know that, that can work and that everybody can live with. But I do think the next year to two years is actually quite important. Other comments, questions? Yeah, Robert. Huge number of thoughts. Um, from a, you know, a very wide um, range in the discussion from the panel. It's a simple question, but then I'll just sort of qualify the the question. So the simple question is: How do we um, ensure that we don't solve the wrong problems very well? Um, 
and and I'll qualify that with a as a cartoon an image in my in my mind, um, where there's a homeless person sitting on the street outside a, an art gallery, and no one nobody's paying attention. Everybody's walking past, and and then there's a picture looking through the window of the art gallery um, to a picture of the same homeless man. And there's crowds of people gathering around this, this piece of art, and they're fascinated at solving this problem that they see through the lens of this piece of art. And, and I can't get rid of that you know, picture in my mind. Um, and, and, it, and so from the panel, we've had a spread on the left of um, you know, social movements and kind of you know, the issues of, of the problems. And I'm reminded of your very powerful Facebook um, story. <coughs> of uh, <coughs> modern day slavery and a philanthropist with a you know a big checkbook you know and that story and the Facebook and I just want a button or you know whatever and how you have to be thoughtful and of course you have to get down to presumably the people who have had a first person story not a McKinsey or not a third person not a data or you know it has to be grounded so on, on the right hand you know we've got the UN and we've got an institutional and, and in my organization, we're always, you know, what problem are we trying to solve? How do we ensure we're, you know, every day, every minute of every day, in our little tiny bubble, we're consumed with that, what problem are we trying to solve? And it strikes me that we all have narratives, stories in our head. And in fact, the UN, you could say, was a series of individual stories who were kind of seized on. So I'd just be interested in how do we, how do you guys think we ensure we're <coughs> Which issues get attention? Are they the right ones? Is that part of what you're wondering? I might be the right. Thoughts? So I, I would I would get, have a very old fashioned answer to that, and I think the the issue that we often confront is that there aren't enough people with a political understanding of the world and how it works. So I mean, I came out of kind of working in politics for six years. I was amazed with how in modern political parties, the incentive structures are all around for, for, for sort of leaders or emerging leaders. It's all about, you know, how do you do the soundbite? How do you do the social media piece? How, how do you just like, you know, it's all of that stuff. And actually that's not politics. I mean, that's part of the process now, but understanding the structures of power that exist in the world and where the blocks are to getting things done. So we're gonna have a great conversation this afternoon about climate. I mean, how, how can you have a conversation about climate that you know assumes even that the governments are the key actors or the only actors in that? I mean, I, I worked in you know we we had a carbon tax, an emissions trading scheme, and a carbon tax um, plan legislation in government in Australia. Um, the whole thing, and it was legislated in the end, and it's all now being dismantled by a government that essentially got kicked back, kicked out because it handled the issue so badly. The key thing that went on there was, I was dealing with the Prime Minister, I had lots of civil society groups coming saying, we really want to mobilise people around this issue. We want to build, like, this is going to be tough, you know, here the Australian economy, it's a resource-based economy, and the most powerful interests are, you know, coal and mining and so on. Um, and, and I was then kind of going to Kevin Rudd, the Prime Minister at the time, and saying, it's great, we've got, like, a really interesting coalition, and it's, it's NGOs, and it's, it's, it's churches, and, and it's... Um, uh, trade unions and all, all, all of these in the climate groups, environment groups. This is like a really interesting opportunity. They're coming together around it. And he said, I've got the votes. Why would I bother? Why, why talk to them? Why waste our time with them? And, we got, and it's like, all right. At that moment, he did. Lost the public debate because he never tried to prosecute to sustain public support and ultimately, you know, and handled it badly and, and, and lost out. But didn't understand. And my, my larger point to him wasn't so much about, you know, engage these groups, but it was like, understand what you're up against. Like it, you're trying to, you know, quite significantly change the future structure of the economy here. And there are massively entrenched vested interests who aren't that enlightened about this. So you've got to think about the coalition. The, you've got to think politically about this. This is going to be hard. You can't anticipate all the difficulties you're going to have. But you're going to have a lot of them. You need as many friends as you can. And I think this is where the sort of thinking, in the, the GSM thinking can be very powerful. If you start with an understanding of power structures and you get the fact that, okay, you know, there's government, there's state actors, highly constrained, highly constrained in what they can do. 
this idea that, you know, and, and I, one of the things I used to do a lot of fundraising in the business community, because working politics, you know, the campaigns are funded that way. Um, you know, most of the business community really doesn't understand. They think that a prime minister, a president, is like a CEO, that they can make a decision and make it happen. It's like, well, you, you, you know, your office may not support it, your colleagues may not support it, the bureaucracy may not support it, they might say it and then not, not implement it. You know, then it's got to go through parliamentary, pro I mean, all of those sorts of pieces. And you've got to deal, you know, if you're politically smart about it, this is where I think old fashioned organising, that kind of thinking is really often what we need to make this sort of the orchestration of networks effective. You've got to think, where's the power? How do we engage? You know, where is it in, in, in business? Is it finance? Is it, you know, manufacturing? Is it tech? Is it resources? And like, who are all those? And because they're not monolithic, right? Like, there's many different players. If I wanted to do, you know, change in the area of sanitation, I would probably go to Unilever, not the United Nations, right? Because Unilever is a more powerful organization with agency on that issue. So, but you know, not on a, a whole lot of other issues. So, so thinking in terms of is it media where the power is? It? Is it our institutions, our courts, our government agencies? Um, you know, is it the new media versus old media? Is celeb do celebrities have a role in this? And and I think that's that's where we need more people who did who have different career experiences. So who don't just you know exist within an NGO silo in their career or UN or you know bureaucracy or private sector, but who jump between those because that's the thinking which makes networks effective. It's that sort of joined up thinking where you can deploy, pull the different levers of power where they're going to be effective. And so I, I would say in my field, you know, people who do the social movement piece, you can be incredibly naive about the role of like getting a whole lot of people in a social movement if they're targeting the wrong person, doing the wrong campaign. It's, so, but they have a role. And I think the, the legitimization that comes, the power that comes from mass participation, mass engagement is far, far greater now than it used to be and much more important. But it's part of that, you know, that, that old... And, and having a, a political understanding in that larger sense um, is just crucial to making all of these efforts um, effective and impactful. Tom, can I bring you back into the, I mean, I'm curious because you wrote Gridlock recently, a, a book which offered a, an interesting prognosis on, on where we were, you know, the state of cooperation and collaboration today in solving global problems. And I'm curious, you know, given what Tim has offered here in terms of the importance of these kind of coalitions and what your research has suggested, how do we accelerate this phenomenon in terms of, of getting you know, organizations with resources and clout and so forth to invest in building these coalitions of the willing around these intractable mm -hmm. issues? Well, I think there's a lot that um, traditional actors can do through this orchestration technique. And they are doing it, but they can do more. Um, and they might be able to do it in ways that um, others can't, just because of the legitimacy they have, the ability to speak for different voices. I wanted to connect this to the question about what problem we're solving, because um, it really is a question of who defines the problems we tackle. If we look at who starts Global Solution Networks, or who are there, or entities that, uh, that are involved with them, there's a lot of participation from them around the world, but they're mostly started by rich organizations in the global north, almost exclusively, in fact. And that means that at the same time that um, developing countries are, for the first time, getting their, you know, feeling their weight at the intergovernmental level, being able to actually make choices and enforce decisions in inter intergovernmental bodies, the rest of the world is coming along and saying, sorry, we're, now the action is shifting to this realm. So, and they're saying, you know, we're just starting to get our hands on, the, on this picture. Um, and it's frustrating. And that's why you see some of this reaction. So I think a key challenge is how to bring um, this, how to use this approach in a way that serves the needs of people who increasingly matter for world politics and will have to be part of any solution for a solution to be a solution. There's just no way around that. Um, that's why I think broad entities like the UN actually could be a sort of key entity because they're one of the few that actually um, can bring together these different voices, gridlock aside. Um, so I think the, there's no way around the kind of structure of world politics. New forms can help us find new ways to work within that structure, but we need to be very aware of it. Alistair. Yeah, um, about the characteristics of success. I, I, I perfectly agree 
mainly Western organizations. But if you uh, look at it uh, from, uh, uh, from a, in another cultural context, like uh, for Asian organizations, uh, they might be you, I would add the fifth characteristic, uh, uh, which is um, the character of leadership. Yeah, in Asian organizations, which I kind of heard of, um, the organization's culture uh, can be very different uh, with a new leader coming in uh, the following day. So it might well be that um, an organization can be a perfect orchestrator over here on day one, but it can be a dominator uh, over here on uh, the next day. Because uh, I, as I observe, some um, uh, uh, some leaders still have uh, a mindset of too much con command and control, and they like to formalize things. They like to uh, make uh, things uh, get complicated uh, uh, with uh, a very formal governance structure, and um, uh, and actually these. Uh, create some more problem before the original problem is solved. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, the, uh, if we take a look um, at the uh, the cultural difference uh, in the um, in uh, corporate management, uh, I think we need to just just to have a remark uh, uh, after the organization culture. Mm -hmm. Do you want to reflect on that, Bruce? The issue of well, it, <clears throat> it certainly strongly resonates with me. What what you said, and I, um, I mean, you asked the question earlier as well. Um, to me, one of the most amazing things in a place like the UN is you get a succession of new leaders coming in with very, very, very different visions and concepts and understandings, even of what their, fun of what their role is. Um, I actually do a case study at Columbia where I compare a whole bunch, slightly change the names around. Um, and uh, the, the point of it is not, it's not good or bad, obviously. The point is very different understandings of what leadership is, what it means, how you exercise it, the instruments of it. Um, so um, I, I do think that these things can change overnight. And um, uh, and it's, uh, I, I, I don't know, I don't, it would be interesting to look more at whether certain institutions have more um, safeguards against, you know, leadership being completely dominant in that sense from an organizational culture point of view, and whether some organizations are more open to that. I, I, that would be an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Tom? In the other workshop that we have running here today, we're looking at transnational climate governance institutions, so GSNs, but also other kinds of entities in the world of climate change. And one of our studies there is looking at how Chinese cities and companies participate in these networks or not, because if they're not working there, they're not working, you know, their, their, their potential other solution is circumscribed. Um, what we find is that there's a lot of Chinese participation by cities and companies in these kinds of bottom up networks, but it happens in a very different way than um, in a country like the United States, for example. The way Chinese companies participate in Chinese cities participate is to achieve, um, they participate in the kinds of networks that help them implement governmental policy. So China has new carbon markets, which are starting up in, as a pilot program in various cities. And Chinese companies and cities have been participating for a long time in the voluntary versions of those, the transnational GSN kind of versions of those, in order to gain the expertise um, to be able to uh, function effectively in those new kinds of governance solutions. Um, I have less engaged in the ones where there's not a clear policy directive pushing them in that direction. So here again is an opportunity. The Chinese government has the ability to help push its companies and cities into these kinds of international networks, orchestrate them in that direction, if you will, um, to help them achieve the government's reduction targets, which are very important, um, in a different kind of way. So the, for us, it's more about um, leadership style matters, but it's not, it shouldn't be seen as a barrier or a facilitator. It's about making it work within the context. Um, as I think you're mentioning. Yeah, but, uh, but in China, uh, I agree with um, the, uh, the observation that you share. Mm -hmm. uh, in my experience, working with the mainland Chinese, to be specific, um, it is the, the reason why Chinese governments can um, direct, uh, either directly or indirectly, um, the uh, other um, uh, corporations who are seen uh, to be um, uh, superficially irrelevant uh, to the Chinese bureaucracy in Beijing is that. Um, uh, it's all down to political culture. It's deeply rooted uh, in the Chinese culture for thousands 
And um, uh, also, after the Communist Party took over uh, uh, the regime, uh, they have specified that uh, all uh, corporates or even the football team in in city have to follow the leadership of Communist Party without any reservations. So uh, what is a, a new Chinese president like Xi Jinping's tactics to power? A lot of people in China um, spend in, um, days and nights thinking about what uh, Xi Jinping is, is, is going to do next. Uh, and we have to get ready uh, to change right after he opened his own golden mouth in, in Chinese province. So the, the, that's why um, I think that um, the leadership problem is still a uh, particularly um, a, a significant factor in shaping world peace, uh, which we were talking about. I mean, a JSM that should increasingly involve more Chinese actors. <coughs> Last word, and then we, we have to call time on the panel. I think the question about organizations and culture is really interesting, especially within the context of how it evolves over time in relation to networks. And as different actors come into it, the politics with a small p changes as different norms are introduced into the network. And I think that's especially true in the context of the private sector organizations. Private sector organizations, especially the very large ones, tend to have quite idiosyncratic cultures and their own norms around behavior and expectations. And it may be that a network is chugging along very happily, but needs resources in order to get, it, to get to the next level of development. So they reach out to the private sector to access those resources. But the quid pro quo for those resources is the introduction of new organizational norms and cultures and expectations about service delivery, expectations of effectiveness and efficiency of the network. And that introduces friction. Um, and sometimes, you know, terminal friction into the group. I think it would be a really interesting area to look at. Uh, how do these, how does the politics of the network evolve with governance changes and the introduction of different cultural norms, uh, both in terms of, you know, geographic and, um, uh, and, uh, and kind of norms of cultures, but also organization and the expectations of those different types of organizations. Thanks for that, Simon. So we've exhausted our time. I think one thing that's clear is that Tom and I are going to need to sit down and, and devise round two of orchestration because there's a lot of juicy research questions here for us to follow up on. And, and thanks for, for all of your insights and contributions. And thanks, everyone. Let's give a round of applause here to the panel for the insights. <laughs>